All right, hello, welcome. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for joining us um, for one of our spotlight guest interviews with Julie Doucette. Um, I have a short bio to read, and um, then we will jump into questions. My name is Rachel Miller, also. I'm a feminist media scholar based out of Ohio State. I'm very excited to be here today. So, Julie is a prolific cartoonist and artist. Her landmark comic, Dirty Plot, began as a mini-comic mini in 1988 before it was picked up by Drawn and Quarterly. Over 12 issues, Julie reshaped the alternative comics landscape, leading us through her dreams, diaries, and her forays to New York City and elsewhere. In addition to, to comics, her vibrant career spans collage, silk-screened artist books, and animation. Her publications include 365 Days, Carpet Sweeper Tales, My Most Secret Desire, and now a new beautiful collected edition of Dirty Plot, um, which is available for sale up at the Drawn and Quarterly booth. So welcome, Julie. Thank you. We also have our translator, Megan, up with us today. So, um, okay. So now, now that we have this collected edition of Dirty Plot out and available to the world, um, what is it like to have this edition available to readers? Um, did you ever see it becoming available uh, as a collected uh, book like this? Or? Uh, it kind of makes me feel old. <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah, it's a bit strange because I've not been drawing comics for 20 years now, so uh, yeah, I feel a little bit like an has-been. Oh. Uh, <laughs> And of course, it's very nice to have a big book like that uh, with everything in it, even a few stories that were never published, uh, even in my fanzines at the time, um, because uh, even then I thought they were just too uh, raunchy and too <laughs> silly and stupid, so. <laughs> Yeah, it's exciting to have like the whole work available to readers, um, especially because it's been out of print for so long, um, or more difficult to get a hold of, right? Okay. Um, so I'm really interested in talking to you about Dirty Plot's life as a mini comic or a zine, um, because before it found a home at Drawn and Quarterly, you started it, uh, self-publishing it as a mini comic. Um, so what was that first life like of, of the comic? Um, when you were self-publishing it? Um, I started doing my own mini-comic when I was an art student, actually, a little bit after that. Uh, uh, art school wasn't really for me, and uh, in art school I met some guys who were drawing comics, so that's how I got started with that, and I dropped out of school thinking that I'm going to draw comics, so I... I um, I started my own. I was on welfare, and I, I published one issue a month for 14 months. That's that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but there were sometimes there were only eight pages, including the the covers, so it was not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I just made um, I just printed as I haven't made a zine since like I was in high school or college, and it, it's the work of putting together the zine. Um, I don't think people realize how much goes into self-publication, right? I don't know if you can speak to that at all. I mean, I was doing that full-time pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I was very motivated and loved doing that. And I mean, photocopying is not so bad. Folding, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stapling, <laughs> yeah. And I was printing maybe 50 copies. I mean, it was not uh, not too know, much. No. Um, you mentioned that there were people in your art school um, who are also doing comics. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the community of zine makers or self-publishing cartoonists that you were working with um, as, as you were beginning to, to make those mini comics. Uh, they were all guys, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you have to remember that it was uh, the mid-80s and uh, yeah, it was pretty bleak, and uh, really we were doing that out of desperation in a way because there was just no jobs, no uh, future. <laughs> so yeah, it was very underground, and 
what can I say? <laughs> were you eager to find other women who were making comics at the time, or were you, um, like, were you trying to seek out that community of other women in any way? No, there weren't any. Yeah. Well, there was this <laughs> this one woman, but she was a bit older than me, and I admire her so much. Uh, to me, she was, she was out of reach. What, what was her name? Uh, uh, Diane Obam. She's uh, being published in at John and Cochelina. Oh, great! So, yeah, yeah, at last. So there was this other woman, uh, but I just couldn't relate to her mm -hmm. uh, because she was. It's seems incredible to say that, but to me, she was too much of a, a feminist, but a hardcore feminist. Oh, okay. <laughs> which I couldn't really relate to at the time. So you weren't like self-identifying at the time as a feminist, or like that kind of world was intimidating in some way? Yes and no. Uh, I, of course, I was a feminist, but uh, that the, the trend of feminism at the time was quite different from what it was today and uh, there used to be that magazine in uh, in Quebec a feminist magazine which was called uh, La Vie en Rose mm. and uh, I, I bought every issue of it and I, I read them cover to cover but I, I couldn't it was just not me at all yeah in a way was it what was in that magazine? Was it comics? Was it no, no, essays? No, no, no. Essays mostly. Okay, so yeah. like, yeah, yeah, about uh, women's life in in general, you know, about uh, women, uh, um, about uh, maternity or women, uh, working women who uh, uh, are not getting paid enough. I mean, it was all so uh, foreign to me in a way, and the tone of uh, the text also is. Yeah, because yeah, when I think of your early comics, I think of them almost as like very playful um, and, and experimental, um, trying out these different ideas about, you know, um, whether it's your dreams or your, your body or things like that. So, yeah, also uh, there's something happened. I was, when I was doing the mini comics, I was distributing them in uh, bookstores and record stores and all that. And there was this bookstore in Montreal. Uh, it was uh, all uh, uh, feminists, mostly, and okay. uh, gender and things like that, and political. And I wanted, I gave them my, my fanzine to ask them if they wanted to uh, to sell them, but uh, they looked at it and they told me that uh, it was too violent. Like there was too much violence against women. So wow. to me, uh, that said it all, you know. I, and you felt like your comics weren't translating to those spaces that were expressly feminist, yeah. like a feminist bookshop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so interesting. Um, okay, I want to talk a little bit about the early comics, um, like the first couple issues of Dirty Plot. Um, Almost immediately, the dream comic is one of the main genres that you're working in, illustrating your dreams. Um, and I'm really just interested, why dreams? Like, wh why this kind of story? Um, and not like autobiographical stories or that sort of thing. I guess I was having very, very strange dreams. <laughs> and they, they were great because, you know, they were all already written stories with a beginning, middle, and, and conclusion, and end. So it, it was great. <laughs> that worked for you. <laughs> yeah, it was great material. Yeah. yeah, and these were like actual dreams that you were having. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. I'm trying to find good slides on our slideshow. Um, of course, as you mentioned, uh, some of the dreams were were quite violent, um, and you you depict yourself um, being attacked in certain certain of the dreams. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in your process. What was it like to work through this material to try and depict yourself um, as you saw yourself in dreams, essentially? Uh, how to, uh, <laughs> I'll try, I can try and reframe the question. If no, you, well, okay. uh, it's, uh, I've never been an artist who uh, was, uh, I mean, I've always been very compulsive, mm -hmm. so I was not really, uh, uh, reflecting on, on what I was doing. I would just be uh, acting all the time. You know, I had to put the ideas right, uh, right away on paper. So to, I, I cannot, 
answer that question. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so were you making these strips like very quickly as they came to you then? It was just kind of like... Yeah, well, I had the ideas and then uh, rolled them down, more or less, the text, and then uh, it took me some time to, to sit down to uh, get to draw them because I was a bit lazy about it. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of those interior spaces are really like densely populated with like objects and um, there's a lot of like spot blacks and that's that takes time to do. Uh, then it, again, <laughs> it was uh, very compulsive, and also uh, as a kid, I always loved the drawings with, uh, uh, that were filled with details, you know, yeah. in children's books or in uh, comics. Was there any is there any particular comic from your childhood or a children's book that um, that really kind of sparked you sparked your? Uh, not really. <laughs> not really. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, uh, so from the title on down, um, you're very forthcoming in writing about or drawing your body from kind of everyday ordinary things like menstruating to strips where you're imagining what it would be like to be a man. Um, and what we get are these like um, super <laughs> radical images um, that span, that kind of connect the ordinary and the everyday to um, this almost fantasy world, right? Um, so where was this work coming from for you? Why, why were you more interested in, in drawing about menstruation or, or imagining what it would be like to be a man? Why, why was it this material? Uh, I guess I was, uh, I was troubled about myself and uh, about my femininity because uh, I didn't really feel like I, I, I was feminine enough and I was very boyish, um, and there was nobody like that around me, so I had a lot of trouble to, to deal with that. Uh, of course, as an heterosexual, you, you want to please the boys, but you don't really know. There was a conflict be, uh, in between uh, how I really wanted to be and then how I thought I was supposed to be. So uh, I think all the, this stuff about uh, being a man and uh, about having my periods and all that. It's all about uh, that, that uh, conflict in a way. And also I have to say at the time I, I could never ever imagine that I would ever be published. So it was just whatever. <laughs> <laughs> These, yeah, they do feel like very private, very personal things. Um, when you read the strips, like almost confessional in a way, even though they're not strictly autobiographical. No, no, not at all, no. no. Yeah. No, I just was using my own character uh, just very naturally to tell the stories. It's not like a, uh, in, in my mind, I was not at all uh, doing autobiography. Uh, yeah, at that yeah. point, yeah. Um, particularly the strips in which you envision um, what it would, like, be like to be a man um, have kind of have had this afterlife, um, I think, for queer and trans folks. Um, and I'm not sure that I have really like a specific question about this, but did you imagine that these comics would be so meaningful to that particular community? No, I, I was completely out of touch. Uh, I have I had no idea. It, well, of course, I had some ideas that. Uh, existed, but uh, I thought it was like a minuscule uh, 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 life, uh, a crowd or part of the society. It's not like today. Uh, right, where there's this like large visible community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Going back to kind of like your early experiences um, in feminist bookstores or with people who identified as feminists, um, were you yourself thinking of these stories in expressly feminist terms? No, 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 because uh, like I said, I thought I didn't really, uh, I couldn't relate with women really. Uh, and also that's why I was very comfortable to be in a, in a crowd like uh, the comic crowd because they were mostly men and I felt, uh, I share more things with them in the sense more tastes uh, in literature or whatever. 
Um, so yeah, it came as a surprise when I realized that uh, actually women could relate to my own comics. Yeah, this work was translating to a lot of women. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah And of yeah. course you published in um, women's comics, the Phoebe Glockner, the issue that Phoebe Glockner edited, and Weirdo when it was being edited by Eileen kaminsky Um What was it like making those connections and working with, with those, those, um, those folks? Uh, I barely knew about them. Yeah. <laughs> so because I, I, you know, I, I'm French Canadian, so I, my culture is pretty much French from France or or Quebecois. So I discovered American underground comics very very late. Okay. So uh, Phoebe Glockner, I didn't know her at all, and uh, Alan Kaminsky from a little bit because of uh, Robert Crumb, but uh, I never uh, read her comics. Did you read them after you worked with her? Or? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, but uh, I pretty much discovered all of her comics and uh, her very early comics about uh, uh, having uh, her periods and things like that uh, through the, the book that was just published by John and Quarterly. Oh yeah, that's yeah. such a beautiful bu book, yeah. the, the Collected Bunch stories. Yeah. 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 Um, so, of kind of going back to those early comics, the early um, issues of Dirty Plot, I'm trying to find the slide that I want to use again. <laughs> um, <laughs> Of course, uh, as much as you are kind of very playful in terms of depicting your body, um, there are also moments that are very gross or violent. Um, and you, you cut yourself, you infamously kind of castrate a man. And um, since these comics were so personal and private to you, um, what kinds of reactions did you get to, to this material? Did, and did it line up with what you were expecting at all? Uh, <laughs> well, it's not, uh, yeah, I guess it was what I expected, more or less. It's not like I had any very wild reaction uh, that was completely out of place. Uh, what I remember is uh, that was, that's really surprised me was uh, I'd get letters from guys who were telling me that uh, the, the my strips about uh, having my periods, they uh, really troubled them. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, the, that was what they couldn't handle? <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the, they made, it made them uncomfortable, <laughs> which to me was very strange because it's such a natural thing. Yeah. Know? It's not like they didn't have any girlfriends or I guess. <laughs> they just didn't know. <laughs> yeah. um, Going along with that, um, there's this kind of like theme of like cutting throughout your work, and then also like that translates into what you do with collage now. Obviously, <laughs> you you cut up materials and yeah. But I was wondering if you could talk about that at all. Um, the cutting process, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or just just uh, I guess. Um, there are like very early stories where you depict yourself kind of cutting yourself. There's the, the story of you castrating someone, right? Um, and I wonder, like, do you see a relationship between those kinds of stories and then your fi fine arts practice now, or? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, all the thing about the cutting up uh, and scarification uh, in those days, I'm, it was, uh, was not trendy, but it was kind of, a, it was like uh, having a tattoo, it was all in the air. I mean, people would talk about that and try things like that. So it's not like I, I was, it came out of nowhere. So uh, yeah, so uh, it just existed and it was my contribution to it, if you will. <laughs> um. One of the things that I really loved about the new box set is that they included all of the letters pages um, from the original issues. It's so fun to go through and read all the letters that you were getting. Um, and I'm interested in what your relationship was like with your readers as you were kind of receiving this feedback. And uh, 
my relationship. Um, in what sense? Um, just um, there seems to be this kind of like community of people who really were attracted to your work and immediately fans of it. Um, and I, I would notice, you know, you would ask for like, send me pictures of your tattoos or mm. like, th you would invite your readers to kind of participate in the comic. Um, so I get, yeah, I'm interested in that. Uh, I have to admit, I don't really remember why, <laughs> how I came up with the idea of uh, <laughs> asking people to send me pictures of uh, their tattoo. I guess <laughs> it was in the air. Yes, but uh, to, to ask them to send me pictures of uh, their penis, that's, uh, I really don't remember what, <laughs> why and how I came, by, came up with that. I guess I was just testing people to see <laughs> if they would do it, but they actually did it. <laughs> I remember there was one issue where you ask in like the letters page, please stop sending pictures oh, yeah. of your penis <laughs> to me. Okay, I've had enough now. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did. Okay, so I'm just not rereading myself at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably okay. <laughs> um, so in the, the later issues of Dirty Plot, you kind of turn towards more autobiographical work. Um, the early issues are a lot of fantasy, a lot of dreams. Um, and, and these autobiographical pieces are personal in a much different way. So I'm wondering what brought you to the point where you were ready to divulge these um, stories about your, your life? Um, uh, I just needed to move on to something else, to another form of uh, comic uh, writing. Um, and, I, you know, when you write autobiographical story, it's, uh, people think that it's very personal, but actually it's not that much because you always uh, pick uh, 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 an aspect of your life, you know, one or two aspects of, of your life, and you leave quite a lot of things out. So, uh, so it's not that personal and revealing. And I always find it strange to uh, get letters or feedback from people who tell me that oh, it's a, yeah, I feel that I know you, but it's a, to me it doesn't make any sense. These were like small parts of your life that yeah. 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 Um, you write a lot about, of course, in my New York diary, your move to New York City. It didn't seem to be a very positive experience. Mm -hmm. No. Um, and I was just, uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, I'm really interested in the fact that you called it a diary, um, because it, it both is and isn't. Um, and I'm just wondering like, how that story kind of came together for you as you were serializing it. Um, and what, what were some ways that you were like, structuring um, your experiences in New York uh, in the comics? That's a lot of questions, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the thing is that I don't remember. <laughs> uh, why was it a diary? I don't know. I guess you're right. It's, a, it's not a diary. Uh, Were you keeping a diary at the time? Yeah. Uh, uh, at the time of uh, the New York, uh, my New York year? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes, it's true. Yeah, maybe that's why I, I ended up calling it a diary. Yeah. But the di actual diaries were pretty different. Uh, yeah. So once again, I left out quite a lot of stuff uh, f uh, from the... the yeah, that story. And those are all in the in your own personal diaries, yes. all <laughs> the left out stories. Um, I guess so. I do want to talk a little bit about um, 365 days and your work in collage. But before I get into that, I was just interested in what what comics were influencing you at the time or even just fine art, novels, music, anything? What, what do you consider your set of influences, um, either now or when you were making, ma making comics in the 90s? Uh, my main uh, influence, uh, uh, it would be this French writer, uh, Christiane Rochefort. Uh, I got to, to uh, read her books when I was 12, and it was the first time ever that I could actually uh, I don't identify myself to a character uh, because they were not that uh, uh, 
uh, feminine and she was a special sort of feminist because uh, she, uh, it was not only about women, it was very much about gender and uh, identity. So I, I really could relate to that. And it was a lot about uh, uh, child, children's right. It was a f kind of a funny mixture of stuff. So, and after that, of course, there was, uh, there were comics. I grew up with Tintin and things like that. And also there was uh, that magazine, Arakiri, uh, which was actually all the people from uh, Charlie Hebdo. Okay. And they were very, very raunchy uh, magazines with comics, but also a lot of pictures and, and fumetti. Uh, they were awful. <laughs> And very macho, I guess, but they, they had absolutely no border, and they, they, they were very uh, obnoxious. But it, yeah, it really spoke to me in a way because they they just put whatever they came to, through their mind on, on paper. And and you were you reading these um, when you were like younger, or while you were in art school? Um, or then, or after, like at what point were you reading those magazines? Uh, I guess that was more like uh, when I was a child. <laughs> <laughs> it's because one of my, my cousins had uh, the, some of Arakiri uh, hidden under his bed, so. Uh. <laughs> that always works. <laughs> the older cousin who has the, <laughs> yeah. the all the good stuff. Um, okay. Yeah, so 365 days is really a record of all these different arts practices that you're working through. Um, and of course, n you don't make comics now, um, but you do make things like collage, um, more fine arts pieces. Um, so why were, why were you drawn to kind of documenting that process in 365 days? Uh, to me, it was not that much about uh, documenting. Uh, it was about an uh, improvisation project, mm. really, drawing a page every day. Uh, there was no sketching, no nothing. It was just everything on paper. So, uh, of course, it's uh, very repetitive and it could be very boring, but somehow, uh, for some reason, it works and people love that book. Um, and it was quite a lot of fun to do, but uh, documenting, uh, uh, I have to say my diaries in general were never about uh, putting uh, um, emotions or my, my state of mind, not that much. It was all, always about uh, the facts. Like what's happening during yeah, that day. Yeah, 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 strangely okay. enough. And it just naturally happens that you're cutting out stuff for line of cuts and, and things like that um, throughout the course of that diary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was my everyday life uh, at the time. Running to the Xerox shop <laughs> in the rain. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, I do, and I wanted to um, kind of, before I open it up to questions, talk about Carpet Sweeper Tales, which is a beautiful book. Um, no, no cartooning in it at all, but collage. Um, could you talk a little bit about how this book came to be? Uh, what I wanted to do first, uh, it all started with the text. I wanted to uh, work with sort of a sound poetry. Mm. But I realized that uh, it was just not a good idea just to do that. It was uh, just a <laughs> uh, financial suicide to do that. So, <laughs> so I, I figured I will uh, add some pictures to go with that. Mm -hmm. So that's how it started, and I, I figured it uh, well. It it worked pretty nicely. So, uh, so that experiment was. Uh, that type of writing to me was also because I was, uh, at that point I was, uh, I had a lot of uh, trouble with making pictures mm. because there are so many pictures around where like 
uh, inundated with uh, pictures, and uh, to me it felt like uh, uh, it didn't make sense at all anymore. It seemed to me that making a picture in two seconds, it was uh, uh, completely emptied from its meaning, so that's why I ended up uh, writing only and then eventually writing things that just didn't make any sense because I, I just wanted to non-communicate. <laughs> so that's what happened with that. That feeling that we're just inundated with images and pictures, is it more exacerbated for you now? Is it more extreme? Um, uh, well, I came, I came over it a little bit, I guess, yeah. Um, I, whatever I do now, I don't, it's like I, I, want, I want to go on retirement in the sense <laughs> that I don't want to, uh, to do things in, in uh, thinking that it's going to be, uh, published, so I, I really, really, really do it only for myself, not thinking about anything else. So uh, it might be completely unpublishable, but yeah, I... But uh, now it's just solely for you. Yeah, I, 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 I almost don't want to, to show any, anything that I'm doing because it doesn't make any sense to me to... Uh, uh, to make pictures, but uh, I tried to stop making art at some point, but uh, I lasted 24 hours. So. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just so compulsive that I have to do something. So uh, whatever I do, I make pictures or I write things, but uh, I, in a way, I, I don't believe in it up to some point. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I have a big problem with art <laughs> these days. <laughs> Do you still keep diaries? No, 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 it's been a while. Yeah. yeah it's too time uh, consuming. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I understand that. Um, so you're in Montreal now, right? Mm -hmm. um, and are you very involved with the like local arts community there? Or are you, like you said, you're kind of just making stuff for you, but are you? Uh, I've always been some sort of a satellite in the sense that I'm part of, a, you know, uh, the, the visual arts a little bit. I made some animation films, so I met some people from animation film. Um, I've got friends who make video. I've got friends who make sound art. Uh, some cartoonists also. So I, yeah, I guess I'm part of an art scene, but not a very specific crowd. Really, not like just expressly comics. No, 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 no. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about your work in animation? Uh, did how, like, you how did you come to why why animation? I guess, and how how did you come to that particular form? Uh, I guess it was something to try. Uh, oh yeah, no, um, it's true. I I I made a project with Michel Gondry. <laughs> The filmmaker, uh, it's, uh, I didn't really like the, the, the experience, but then again, uh, to see him work with animation films uh, was very, very inspiring. So that's how it got started for me. So I, I had this friend uh, who was making animation films, so she, show, she showed me a little bit like the basics. And from there, I started to make uh, animation films, but they're mostly uh, abstract shapes, but with words, text. That, also that's very time, the, sorry. <laughs> no, it's the basis of everything. And also very time consuming <laughs> animation. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah. But I kind of like that to do uh, some uh, very repetitive stuff. That I have absolutely no problem with that. Yeah. Um, OK, I think we have a lot of time for questions. Mm -hmm. If people, I do want to open it up to the audience. Um, you can go to the microphones at the back if you have a question um, so that we're recording. So we want to make sure we can hear your voice. Yes. Hi there. I just wondered if you, uh, it's a follow up question to you saying that you have sort of a problem with art. I, I find it fascinating. I, could you just talk a little bit more about that? Could you expand on that, please? 
Um, uh, it's, uh, I think what the world, uh, at least around me in Montreal, what, uh, what's missing is uh, art that, uh, that is more um, political in a way, because I think the world really, really needs that. But uh, the people who are actually uh, making art like that would will show their art in galleries or in museums, but to me, it doesn't make any sense. It's like making faces uh, in the dark, you know? <laughs> so uh, I wish people would go outside and, you know, put stuff uh, on the walls. I mean, make, make free art and don't, don't expect anything uh, back. Uh, okay, I criticize the... Uh, art and all that, and, but I don't do it myself, but I, I, I don't feel I really have it in, uh, in me to do that. Uh, personally, I'm not a very articulate person, so it wouldn't work, but uh, yeah, and I think uh, at least in Montreal, uh, what I see is uh, the artists have become um, domesticated mm -hmm. in some ways. We'll go over to the side. Yes. Um, whenever I see a dirty plot, like it always sort of reminds me of German expressionist woodcuts because of the uh, the sort of etching style it has to it. Was that an influence on you, or is that just like a coincidence? I guess it was a coincidence, but you know, uh, influences. Uh, it's never one thing to me, at least. It's never one thing uh, in particular. It's a, it's like a mosaic of uh, so many different things. Uh, and of course, I, I love the, that type of art. It's possible, yes, that it it has been an influence uh, in some ways. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Yes. Um, so speaking about influences, um, thinking about the New York Diary, uh, had you by any chance seen uh, the work of Chantal Ackerman's The News From Home? She's a French filmmaker. Yes. Uh, it was very, it, 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 there was a lot of echoes of that. Not, not that you were like, I'm going to do what she did, because it wasn't at all. But there was a lot of echoes of that in there for me. Yeah, uh, but uh, I saw her films maybe five years ago for the first time, so. <laughs> um, and then also talking about, again, about influences, uh, the collage artist, uh, Hannah Hoke. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, had, had, was that something that you picked up in art school, or is that also a later? Yeah, much later, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I guess I was completely out of touch, or also, uh, I tend to not look for for art, uh, and uh, because I, if I see absolutely wonderful work, I I get discouraged right away. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'd rather not go to uh, galleries or uh, look at too many books, especially books like collage. If I'm making collage, I I'm just not going to look at that at all because it's a, uh, it will have a, an awful effect on me. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, we'll go over here. Um, I have a question about uh, when you started to learn English. Uh, how, how early or late in life was that? Uh, we had to learn English uh, in high school, um, but I really did uh, learn English when I, I moved to, uh, to New York. And I took a, a whole year to start to, to be able to actually speak okay English. Um, and the, the reason why I ask that is uh, as you, like through all the different mediums that you've worked in, the animation, the collage, the screen printing, where you're doing poetry and the layering, there's this, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering uh, if you have a conscious or just an, an awareness of when you started to really want to play with how language can kind of be like broken and decoupled and also like with images and if it does that relate to uh, being more uh, bilingual or, or, or being asked to 
occupy that English space when the, f the, the French is your natural like uh, mode? It's um, writing in English to me uh, in a way was very convenient because not being it my, my language, uh, I was not too self-conscious about it and I knew that I just had to do my best and uh, to write English and in a way it gave me a lot of freedom which I wouldn't have, uh, I, I don't have in French because I, you know, you, you, uh, you stop at every word and want it to be absolutely perfect and, and express exactly what you want to express. And also it depends on the medium also. Um, when I did collage, like uh, the, the carpet sweeper tail, for some reason, uh, it works so much better in English, uh, if you can call it English, but I tried in French and it's, it doesn't work as well. The magazines that you were cutting out, were they in French or English or both? English, okay. English. Uh, yeah. There were uh, 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 garden, oh, home and gardens yeah. Yeah. <laughs> from the 50s. Yeah, that's perfect. Great, thank you. Thanks. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm, I think I'm about your age, and I remember you know, being young and thinking those feminists are kind of bitter. And I'm kind of wondering now, when you look back and think about what you were reading that the feminists were writing and their attitude, do, do you think you can relate to it better now as an older woman rather than a 20-year-old? Yes, definitely, yes, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I, oh, I don't know how to ex express this, but uh, I, I guess what uh, feminism, uh, I don't know how to, <laughs> how to answer that, but yeah, I guess now I have a broader image and uh, vision of uh, what feminism is and also the problems of women in general and uh, that ended up touching me more and uh, in a personal way also. So yeah, I think now it's, uh, it was absolutely normal and it was essential for feminism to, to be that way in those days. And it evolved eventually, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, all, it's all good to me now. <laughs> How do you define that for yourself now? Um, being a feminist, or uh, I think it, you know the 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 woman I talked about, that the, the writer Christiane Rochefort, the, mm. her vision of uh, feminism. I think it's uh, it's very close to that nowadays. It's very inclusive. Uh, it's not only about women, but mm. uh, gender and uh, children. I mean, oppressed communities in general. Yeah, that's a good definition. <laughs> Um, yes. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, what mediums did you begin art with, and um, why, I guess? Uh, I didn't hear you. Sorry. What mediums did you begin um, creating art in, and how old were you? Uh, I, I, I always drew uh, from the time I was a little kid. Uh, for a while, I... For a long time, I, I worked with uh, felt pens, colored felt pens. And after that, uh, I painted with uh, acrylic. Uh, yeah, and then the ink, black ink. Do you have a favorite medium or? Black ink. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I just have a question, because um, obviously, you your, your career path, you started out self-publishing, unselfconsciously, doing your zines for your friends with low print run, but then you transition to being published by Drawn and Quarterly, has, who has been your primary, not only, but primary publisher throughout your career, and I'd be interested in learning how your relationship began and developed, you know, did they reach out to you because they saw your zines, did you reach out to them, did you send it to them, you know, how did that initiate, and a little bit about your relationship with the publisher, I'd be interested to hear. Uh, at the beginning, Drawn and Quatrelli uh, was a magazine right. uh, published by, by um, Chris Oliveros, and uh, I guess at the time, uh, 
uh, and made many uh, mini comics and I started to be published in, uh, in uh, anthology magazines, smaller magazines, but bigger and bigger magazines. And if, uh, Chris wrote to me, I still have the letter. <laughs> He wrote to me, sending me a copy of the, the first, uh, the first uh, issue of Drawing Quarterly, asking me if I wanted to be uh, in this magazine. So that's how it started. Then also, um, uh, yeah, I, I had been published in Weirdo and magazines like that. So I was getting uh, 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 Attention from there. <laughs> uh, she was starting to be recognized. Right. Uh, so, uh, so I wanted to uh, have my own comic book, uh, and uh, Chester Brown uh, wrote to Fantagraphics to tell, to ask them if they wanted to uh, to publish my own comic book, uh, but they rejected me. <laughs> and uh, I told uh, Chris Oliveros about that, and. Uh, the next day, he called me and uh, he told me, "Okay, I'm going to publish it." And that's how it, that's how it got started. It was not planned at all from his, his part, but he just decided to do it. It was you know, Chester was being published by Drawn and Corley at that time. No, right? no, he no, was no, still no. with Vortex then. I mean, okay. Yeah. And so yeah. then, so you were published by Drawn and Corley before Chester. Then he followed you there. Yeah, right? it was the first one. <laughs> right, right. Because but you guys were friends before that. Though. Because he was doing, Yummy Fur had the same trajectory, right? Because he started self-publishing it as a zine. Which one? Chester, Chester did, yeah, did yeah. Yummy Fur was self-published initially, also. Yes. And, yes, and then yes, Vortex yes. picked it up. Okay. Yes. All right. No, and so, like, obviously, you're happy with Drawn and Corley because you stuck with them. But uh, all right. Well, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, first of all, I just wanted like thank you. Um, I guess uh, like briefly about my story. Like I went to a really fancy elitist school and like tried to be like an art major and painting and shit and like I had a nervous breakdown and then I like <laughs> <laughs> um, like for my senior thesis I wrote a graphic novel diary where I was like doing all these drugs and like kind of it was kind of like a fuck you but like I also like wrote like a critical thing about like you like comics and youth culture and shit, but um, you were like probably one of my primary uh, inspirations, especially because like I was always like, I always related to like Woody Allen and like um, kind of like self-deprecating comics and like um, they were all men or whatever, like um, um, from my perspective. And so, uh, and then I, after that, I like went to LA and I like thought I would write like stuff like, um, uh, Seinfeld guy, curb your enthusiasm. Uh, but uh, then I realized, like, oh, maybe I should like write about myself. And then I went to like grad school back in New York. And then I like, then they told me to like take myself seriously and shit. And like, I started writing about art. And I don't know. Over the course of time, like, the, like I started write, reading feminist shit, and I was like, oh, I'm being like violent to myself, and like. And maybe that was bad to be influenced by like Woody Allen and stuff. And, um, but I feel like I lost my voice a lot, like as a result, because I like, I'm good at making fun of myself and things like that. And uh, now I write about like minimalist art and I do sort of like what you were saying, like kind of try to write as little as possible or something. But I just wondered if you had any thoughts about kind of like that self-deprecating humor and that whole like, um, and feminism and stuff like that, and if you ever kind of like felt a conflict about it or uh, stuff like that. I don't know. Thank uh, you, anyway. <laughs> yeah. It's not a very coherent question, but <laughs> uh, like, you think I was uh, doing self-deprecating uh, comics? Maybe not self-deprecating, but just kind of like it was funny, and it was uh, maybe I maybe I'm reading it wrong. I don't know. Uh, New York Diary was the one that I was inspired by, and it just seems like a lot of times uh, it's funny and it's about situations where uh, things fall apart for you, I guess. Yeah. You didn't think of it that way, though, so. Uh, 
a little bit. I mean, I didn't mean it that way. Yeah. And eventually, I, I did worry about that if I was self-deprecating myself, uh, which I really, really didn't want to do. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, not like in a bad way, but just kind of like in a humorous way. I mean, I felt like empowered also by your work, but... Um, there is kind of a humor or lightheartedness to the early issues of Dirty Plot. I think of the, your dream comics, um, and I see the humor there, especially with like all the, uh, there was one very early one with a bunch of like talking objects in it. Yeah. Uh, I think your spoon starts talking to you. So there is like a sense of playfulness. Yeah, 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 but not uh, self-deprecation. Maybe just getting into to. like situations where there's like you sort of find yourself kind of in disasters or relationships that were disasters or I don't know. Never mind. Maybe. Yeah. I'm <laughs> like you're willing to put yourself out there in situations where you don't come across as like a shining exemplar of that you're comfortable that being, you know, I mean, that's No, 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 but uh, you know, I'm not a I'm not like Joe Matt, for instance. <laughs> He's a pretty extreme example, but I, I know that uh, the, over the years after that, quite many people did uh, autobiographical uh, comics, and they, they were, uh, I thought uh, that they were going too far in that way. Interesting, yeah, no. Well, now I feel kind of like, I'm not, I didn't mean to be in any way critical of you. Like I, no, 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 no. I admire you and maybe I'm not like articulating it, but, um, but anyway, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I wanna thanks give uh, our last question asker a moment. So last question. <laughs> uh, I, I first wanna say a comics rule. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I guess my, my question is uh, which artists over the years have like uh, either inspire have inspired you or like you've like resonated with. Oh yeah, yeah. Or like, sorry, specifically like with comics. In comics. Yeah, yeah. If there are any. Uh, well, there's Chester Brown. Um, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of cartoons. <laughs> yeah. So, sorry, yeah, can, yeah. can I ask like, what about like? Yeah. Also, like, if I can add, like, what about them? Have you, if if you if you're able to, like, pin that down, possibly? Uh, I guess it's uh, it's about his drawing and uh, the the way he tells story. There's lots of uh, silences in his uh, comics, I find, which I really like. Which is the also I really like uh, John Porcelino also, mm -hmm. and I think of him because uh, at. He said that uh, what he was interested in in his comics was the moments in between, mm -hmm. which I, I really like that idea. Um, uh, I really like uh, that that woman from Montreal, uh, um, uh, Diane Obamsawin. Uh, well, there are so many, and uh, yeah, my my mind just went blank <laughs> trying to. John was really an early reader of your comics, right? You were sending him your zines even before you got picked up by Drawn and Quarterly. Oh yeah, yeah, we were pen pals. We're still pen pals. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> I think you would make a great pen pal. So. <laughs> All right, I think we're all out of time. So thank you so much, Julie, for talking with us. And well, thank you all you. for joining us. <laughs>